So now I wonder, does anyone remember the news of the world? <laughs> Do you remember that? It was, it was a newspaper that was around when I was a kid and an adult. Uh, it was a, a tabloid that came out on Sunday. It was a bit like the sun on Sunday, but obviously totally different and separate and not the same thing at all. <laughs> Anyway, I seem to remember it, uh, it closed in the end, I think after some scandal about hacking a murdered schoolgirl's phone. Um, and it was a News International paper, I think, so it's a, it's a good job it's not around this week when the government and Ofcom have to decide if News International are fit and proper persons to own B-Sky B. <laughs> that would have been awful for them. But it's not, it's closed and over and done and finished and in the past and not relevant to anything anymore. <laughs> Which is lucky. Now... I'm aware, as I, as I start this piece, uh, of something that Tom Lehrer once said about protest song singers, that uh, it takes a certain amount of courage to get up in a coffee house and come out in favour of the things everyone else is against, like peace and love and brotherhood and so on. <laughs> I feel a bit like that now. Here I am on Radio 4 to register my controversial view that listening to and or deleting messages from the phones of murder victims, terrorist survivors or dead soldiers is a bit off. <laughs> even when it's done by a newspaper that totally doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> I mean, that is very much my opinion, but I just fear I might be preaching to the choir a little bit. And what a choir it is, from Ed Miliband... Immoral. David Cameron... Disgusting. Rupert Murdoch himself. Deplorable. It seemed this week as if no one had a good word to say for the practice of eavesdropping on murder victims. <laughs> Honestly, we're all so united in hating it, it's surprising, really, it ever happened. <laughs> no one seems in favour. Not even Rebecca Brooks, who I assume, as editor of the paper that paid for it, must have... No, no, apparently I'm wrong. Apparently she's totally unconnected with it and didn't know and didn't see. And no one told her and she was on holiday. And anyway, she had a different name at the time, so it doesn't count. <laughs> In fact, she went so far as to say to her employees... I hope that you all realise it is inconceivable that I knew, or worse, sanctioned these appalling allegations. So there you go. It's inconceivable. It actually cannot be conceived. <laughs> you can try, but you won't be able to do it. The imagination faced with the challenge of inventing some kind of crazy, madcap world in which Rebecca Brooks knew where a story in the paper she edited came from just gives up. <laughs> It's like trying to imagine an undiscovered colour or five-dimensional space. Can't be done. We can demonstrate this now, actually. Try. Just, just as a thought experiment, obviously. Just try now, uh, for a moment, to conceive that Rebecca Brooks, as her former employee, Paul McMullen maintains, knew full well that Glenn Mulcair was illegally hacking phones. Any luck? <laughs> no, me neither. I just gave up and imagined a horse on a bicycle. <laughs> Hey, can't be done. Can't be done. Interesting, by the way, that I hope you realise it is inconceivable that I knew is not quite the same legally as I did not know. <laughs> and of course, that's not all. It's also being alleged that News International have in the past paid the police for information. Now, presumably, Rebecca Brooks thinks this is inconceivable as well. Certainly, when asked about it by Chris Bryant MP in 2003, she was less than candid. This is what she said. We have paid the police for information in the past. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant she was totally candid. <laughs> she told the Government Select Committee that that illegal act is what she did. Just to remind you, the government have to decide if News International are fit and proper persons to own B Sky B. <laughs> Now, to be fair, Andy Coulson was also there, and he leapt in to clarify... Uh, we operate within the code and within the law. He said, oh, within the law. Phew. Ha, that's a relief. But Chris Bryant is a bit slow on the uptake, and he said... It's illegal for police officers to receive payments. To which Coulson replied... No, 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 we don't. As I said, within the law. Yeah, he said it was within the law. Weren't you listening, Chris Bryant? It can't be illegal if it's done within the law. <laughs> By definition, you're thinking of those illegal police bribes that other people do. This wasn't one of those. This was a police bribe within the law. They're fine. <laughs> Out of interest, I wonder which law it was within. Because obviously it wasn't the hundred-year-old law against making or accepting payment to a police officer information collected in the course of his duty. It must be within some other law. Maybe that one about abating a smoky chimney. <laughs> anyway... Something, the whole of the choir agree, was deeply wrong at the News of the World, and it happened under the editorship of Rebecca Wade. So who better to investigate it than the chief executive of News International, Rebecca Brooks? No one. No one. No one knows Rebecca Wade better than Rebecca Brooks. They go way back. Way back. 
In the words of comedy henchman Simon Greenberg, when Jon Snow asked how she could investigate herself... When we've got the facts, we'll investigate how that can be possible. <laughs> Fair enough. Simple as that. She'll investigate, she'll get the facts, and when she's got the facts, she can investigate how it's possible for her to have investigated them. <laughs> I mean, it certainly saves on manpower, doesn't it? I just worry she's working too hard, poor girl. <laughs> Because she's going to have to ask herself some tough questions. She's going to have to really haul herself over for coals. And naturally, at first, she'll try to evade herself. But she knows all her tricks. And once she sees that she means business, she will crack. And before long, she'll tell her everything she knows about what she did. And she'll listen very carefully and write it all down in a little book. <laughs> the only problem is, there surely can't be anything to discover. Because, after all, News International looked into all this two years ago when the first Guardian reports came out, and they told the PCC quite clearly that these were the actions of one rogue reporter and that there was no evidence anyone else at the News of the World was involved in phone hacking. By the way, did I say the government have to decide if News International <laughs> are fit and proper persons to run B-Sky B? And, and so, if there's no evidence, there's no evidence. I mean, where else can they look? Well, comedy henchman Greenberg had the answer to this too, this time on the Today programme, where he was at pains to stress that News International was... ...in a fully cooperative mode with the police, as we have been since January. Is it me, or does that slightly raise the question of what mode they were in before January? <laughs> Although, to be fair, it is beginning to sound like their relationship with the police has for some time been very cooperative. <laughs> Almost to a fault. Anyway, Mr. Greenberg has had a bright idea about where to look for this evidence, which News International were adamant in 2009 did not exist. He said... The Millie Dowler information, that's something we weren't aware of. We obviously want to see what information we might have in our archives. Oh, the archives! <laughs> of course! The place where we put the records of stuff that happened in the past. <laughs> Yeah, now you mention it, that's the very place to look. The dusty old News International archives, wherein we repose the huge leather-bound volumes of sent emails, which can in no way be searched electronically through the word Dowler or hack into the murdered girl's phone. No, 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 they must instead be searched very, very carefully and slowly by the senior archivist with his little magnifying glass. <laughs> and they'd better do a good job. Because if they don't, they will face the wrath of the mighty Press Complaints Commission, which has already done so much to prevent the rise of this situation, and which is now prepared to savage them as only a voluntary self-regulating body with no legal powers or sanctions can. Their chairman, Lady Buscombe, has been all over the place this week defending the PCC from charges that they have basically the same powers and influence as Father Ted and Dougal outside that cinema. <laughs> Down with this sort of thing. Careful now. <laughs> when Andrew Neil asked Lady Buscombe to name one useful thing she'd done since the scandal broke, she had an answer. She replied that she had... Demanded to see all the proprietors. Well, that ought to do the trick. If, as I assume, all the proprietors share a debilitating phobia of seeing Lady Buscombe. <laughs> Though, of course, if they do, they can always say no. Whereas Ofcom, the statutory regulator that controls broadcast media, they can impose heavy fines or even refuse to grant a licence to a broadcaster if it feels they are not fit and proper persons to have one. Something that's being decided right now, as it happens about News International, <laughs> as I may have said. <laughs> but anyway, isn't it all academic now? The news of the world has gone. We won. They made the supreme sacrifice and they killed it off. Yeah, that's what they did. In other unrelated news, here's what Rebecca Brooks said on the 28th of June this year, announcing the appointment of Richard Caseby in the new role of managing editor of The Sun and the news of the world. We will take a comprehensive look at where there is common ground across our titles. Where there is common ground, we will find ways of implementing efficiencies and where appropriate, we will find ways of introducing seven-day working. Seven-day working. A cynic might read that as evidence that News International were planning merging the papers at least a fortnight before this happened. And this announcement is just disguising a pre-made decision as sackcloth and ashes whilst clearing the way for the launch of a Sun on Sunday with no baggage in which all the advertisers they've lost this week can cheerfully re-advertise with clean hands. Not to say that this isn't a huge deal with the loss of hundreds of jobs, though of course largely the jobs of people who had nothing to do with the phone hacking, rather than the job of, say, to pick an example at random, Rebecca Brooks, 
who also had nothing to do with it, as we've established, but perhaps in a slightly more pointed way than some. <laughs> but it doesn't prove News International are very, very sorry. What it proves is that they really, really want B Sky B. So there we are. I've stood in front of a Radio 4 audience and I've told them that hacking into the phones of murdered children isn't very nice and nor is Rebecca Brooks, which is two things you all thought anyway. <laughs> so what was the point of that? Well, actually, I think this time there is a point. I often complain about how politicians endlessly go on about listening to the people, as if the people always speak with one voice and as if the politicians had already made up their minds what they were going to hear. But this time is different and unusual and important. This stark, undeniable wrongness of the Millie Dowler case has unified our voice, and this time, they really are listening to us. Because most of the people concerned, broadly speaking, didn't and don't want to do anything about this. Miliband didn't want to make an enemy of Murdoch yet. Cameron didn't want to have an inquiry. James Murdoch wasn't going to end the news of the world just yet, though he would have done soon. But they all changed their mind this week because we shouted louder than they expected. Thank you very much. <laughs>